This has been a great weekend, great convention. By a show of hands, how you appreciate it. <laughs> and to so many great speakers bringing such a great message. And there must be a God, because who else would allow imperfect messengers to carry a perfect message? I was in Staten Island about a month ago riding on the expressway. I saw a sign that said, buckle up. It was blinking on and off. And then riding a little ways down and said, buckle up, no excuses. And I was trying to figure out what that meant. So I figured if I got caught with by the police without a seat belt on, there's nothing I could say to justify not having it on. Nothing. I'm going to tell you guys for this next speaker, buckle up. <laughs> the next speaker is special not because he, uh, well, because he has a great heart and, and, and a great spirit, but also because he's my sponsor. And what a great introduction. He is from New Jersey by way of California and by way of Denver, Colorado. So he's come a long way to be here. And let's give him a good Narcotics Anonymous welcome, uh, Gil L. I need a drink. I'm an ass. They call me Gil. Gil. Oh, shit. It's all right, Harold. I want your four-step on my desk tomorrow morning. <laughs> wow, Garrett. Thanks for believing in me and my recovery. And man, this is a kick-ass convention. I've been to a lot of them, man. This is like they talk about southern hospitality. They better get their ass up here. <laughs> Woo. Hey, thank the rest of the committee for y'all believing in my white ass. <laughs> I'll tell you why. If you didn't, if you didn't get the message this weekend, you sleeping. <laughs> that boy's got me all pumped up now. See, I, I close it out. See, I heard what they said, and now I know what they didn't say. So you're lucky you got here this morning. I'm going to fill in the blanks, probably. I hope to. Anyway, I, uh, it is an honor and a privilege to come share my strength, hope, and experience. And, uh, I mean, I was real sick. I mean, I didn't even find N.A. I was in the other fellowship, you know. And, and it was in that other fellowship that I met some other addicts. You know, they were hiding out, you know. <laughs> I knew who they were. They were up against the wall, you know. <clears throat> with the N.A. shirts <laughs> and hats with the black and white N.A. Ron knows. When I went to N.A., it was guys like Ronnie H. who taught me all about N.A. <laughs> they said, look, man, we, you know, we don't know where you came from, but over here, this is what it is. You know, him and Curtis and those boys. And uh, I'm forever grateful to that. But, you know, uh, let me back you up. I'm going to tell you where I came from, you know, New Jersey. And uh, <laughs> I, I'm not sure what kind of family I was in. My parents would not make front page of Parent Magazine, but it was okay. I love them. And, uh, and you know, and, and I'm still a little nervous. You know, I, I was like, I go, in the, I go in the bathroom and I say the speaker prayer. God, please let me be a hit, you know. <laughs> and so... So, so this lady, she's like, hey, Gil, are you nervous? I said, man, piece of cake. She said, you know you're in the ladies' room? <laughs> I said, oh, shit. I know I'm nervous. So my false pride goes, yeah, where's the urinals? You know, anyway, you know you're trying to make up an excuse. But anyway, you know. I was raised in a mixed neighborhood. And uh, I hung around with a family who uh, 
they had a big brother who played for the New York Giants. And there was like 13 kids in that family. And I hung around with those boys. And, uh, you know, I never fit in belong. I wasn't a jock. You know, I couldn't play baseball, basketball. I double dribbled. I just continued, whatever the hell that meant. <laughs> you know. And so, you know, I'd be the last kid to get picked all the time. You know, it was like always this, okay, we'll take Jill. You know, so. I grew up in the 50s and 60s. I don't look like it, do I? See, drugs preserve my ass. I'll tell you right <laughs> I don't put no battery acid in my butt, I'll tell you that. But, you know, and uh, I can remember, you know, bringing the kids to my house. They liked my parents. My parents, their attitude was, you can hang out in the basement, smoke some cigarettes, have a few beers. At least we know you're not in the street. <laughs> These guys go back to tell their parents. I like Jill's parents, man. They're cool. And my father, he had the Christmas lights up all year round. You ever see? I saw some here, out here, too. That's the first sign of an alcoholic, they told me. You know, July, I'm bringing my friends over. My dad's got the Christmas lights on. They're like, what's up with this? You know, back in the 50s, going over to watch TV. We had two TVs. One was for picture, one was for sound. You know, nothing ever worked. Nothing ever worked in that house. We had a washing machine that would just wash, take the clothes out of it wet, put them in one that just spun, you know. And then the dryer never worked. They hang them up down in the basement. It looked like a camp. You know, and uh, I didn't fit in and belong that way in the sports field, so I joined a gang, 50s and 60s. Two gangs by me. One wouldn't be no fun. You know, just like you see in the Dukes and the Lords. You know, I joined the Lords. Now I'm on a spiritual path, I don't even know it. I hook up with one of them little Greer boys, and, and, and they called him the Nat. And he became my buddy. And, uh, in order to blow on the gang, you had to rob something. First addiction kicks in, stealing. And me and him, we hold up this mom and pop gas station. Old people should have been retired years ago, you know. He keeps the guy busy, I empty out the register. We running in the woods and we got hundreds and fifties and twenties. The guys in the gang, oh man, you guys were cool. And we were fitting in, we were blowing. I mean, I had my hair slicked back. I didn't have no pomade, I used Vaseline. Slick my hair back black leather jacket, I had boots, clip-on earring, I don't want to hurt myself, <laughs> you know, <laughs> tough guy, you know, big tough guy, we, we take that money and we buy all those common street drugs, starter drugs, right, call <laughs> yeah, you know, turban hydrate, tool and all, anything at all, we didn't care, some pot, and uh, I fit in on belong, we would buy Baseball gloves, bicycles, roller skates, you know, and our parents were like, where the hell you get the money for that? And we used to say, raking leaves, shoveling snow, cutting grass, you know, lie like a rug. You know? And it's funny, every time we did something like that, someone would steal our stuff. You know, anything ill-gotten brings an ill return, isn't that true? Yeah. And so, you know, <laughs> we thought, oh, that God, he's after our ass for doing wrong things. And... Uh, I was like the neighborhood pharmacist guinea pig, you know. These guys would go home, raid their medicine cabinets, you know, and say, I was like the Mike, give it a gill, give it a gill, see, gill, try this, see what it does, you know, and I'd be taking, you know, and I'd make believe half the time I was faking a buzz, oh yeah, get some more of that stuff, you know. I don't know what the hell, could have been birth control pills, you know, what do I know, you know, I'm playing the role, you know. I read labels today, <laughs> I'll tell you that. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I outgrew the gang after a while, you know, and uh, I always say I married a blonde, a brunette, and a redhead. <laughs> I'm an addict once them all. <laughs> anyway, you know, so I go down to the Jersey Shore. I'm out of the gang now, you know, I'm growing up. And uh, I meet the blonde, my first wife. And uh, we settled down right over there. And, not too far where Harold lived, Lawrence Harbor, New Jersey. Like 67, wherever the hell it was, and uh, I'm on the beach with the hippies, you know, because they got drugs, and I like what they have. I got four kids in the cottage, and my wife's like, what the hell are you doing down there with them people? You don't belong with them people. But they had what I wanted. <laughs> and finally she said, you know, I'm out of this marriage. I don't love you no more. You're down there, you're using, and I'm falling out of love. And I was like, whoa, wait a minute. 
you know, like the normie part of me was, I was hurt. But the addict part of me was, oh yeah, well maybe with her out of the way, I'll use the way I want to use. You know, so she wanted to sell a house and we split it down the middle. You know, she got the inside, I got the outside. <laughs> it was a two-story home, her story, my story, you know. <laughs> Damn housekeeper, she wanted to keep that house too. I'm in the shed in the backyard. My neighbor's going, man, you're really losing it. You know, if we didn't sell a house, I was going to get a phone and a mailbox. I live in the shed. Hell with her. I use the way I come home loaded, leave loaded, go to work, come home, you know. Finally sold the house. I was gone. When she moved out, my addiction took off. Let me get I spilled everything off. My addiction took off. And I can remember coming home, I was working for Exxon. And you know, addicts support one another. You know, you always find them work, people that use, you know, we got a way of finding one another. And so we're coming home, and of course, we're all going through divorces. You know how, you know, birds of a feather flock together. And so we thought, we come in Perth, Danboy, New Jersey, where I live now, and, and we saw this nightclub called the Playpen. <laughs> it was a Playpen, all right. And we peek our head in the door, and I'm like, boom, ba boom, ba boom, you know, this music is going. I'm like, yeah, man, this is us. And I know we took our paychecks, and we went downtown Perth, damn boy, and we bought us some of these dancing clothes. Like, I had yellow shoes, yellow pants, yellow flower shirt. I'm going to go boogieing. That's what we're going to do. You know, and then we found out if you go to this nightclub early in the parking lot, you know, only like 10, 15 miles from Staten Island, New York, you can cop all you want. And in that parking lot was these little tailgate parties, like warmer upper before you go into the disco. You know, and we'd be doing skin popping, everything. You get anything you want. Already loaded, going in there, getting a couple cocktails, strobe light going, man, I was all pumped up. Had a 33 inch waist, blonde hair, nice tan, I was hot, man, I was going. 29 years old, I was ready for them Juanitas, man, let me tell you. <laughs> I mean, yeah, oh, man, Jesus. Unbelievable, man. I'd, I'd be leaving them nightclubs already loaded, you know. And and, and over in the Sarahville, I'd hit this bridge one night. And, man, boom, and then the cops come. And so I move over to the passenger side, make believe the driver ran away, you know. <laughs> and the cops going, who are you? I said, John Travolta, can't you tell me? Oh, shit, man. Next week, I did the same thing. I missed that turn. I hit the curb. I hit the bridge. One cop shining a light. He says, the other cop, who's that? He says, that John Travolta. He said, you better come with us. And they locked my ass up. And it was out there in that dancing and doing all those nightclubs for three years and partying my goddamn ass off, sex, drugs, rock and roll. I got introduced to cocaine. Ooh, that shit will kick your ass. And, you know, so here I am. I'm a delivery boy. You know, they're cutting it up, bagging it, and I'm delivering I get free cocaine. Every Monday morning, I'm waking up naked. Everybody around me is naked. I don't know who's who. What happened? You know, I don't know who my partner was. <laughs> I figured they were doing me. That's what it felt like. You know. I'll tell you what, I'm a heterosexual. You give me cocaine, we can talk. You know, I'll tell you right now. <laughs> I remember looking in the mirror in my apartment one day. You know, say, you know the deal. Tape the door, tape it with duct tape, you know. I'm looking in the mirror. Somebody with a red dress, red fishnet stockings and heels and lipstick. It's me. <laughs> That's fucking me. But I'll tell you what, today I wear men's underwear. I don't wear one. That cocaine, kick your ass. I had to get away from them people. They got busted. One time when it was ribbons all around the apartments, and I may believe I didn't know I was lost, and that guy said, who are you looking for? I said, oh, I'm in the wrong place. Boom, I was out of there. I never associated with them people again. I didn't do cocaine on a large level. I substituted other drugs. I was afraid of cocaine, although I went back to cocaine, but, you know, and it's like, so, you know, here I am, I'm out on this, on this, I'm doing this nightlife, getting loaded every night, you know, living out of my work truck, 
<laughs> my boss used to say, I'm going to put a sink in a shower in your truck, man. You ain't never like, I moved into a boarding house and I never stayed there. I was always shacking up. Sex, drugs, rock and roll. And uh, I meet my second wife to be. You know, I don't know what it was, but see, my parents were married for like 50 some years. You know, and someone was sharing the other night, read about her parents. And like thick and thin, man, they stayed there. And I thought, when my marriage came apart after seven, I thought, some, you know, I failed. Somewhere along the lines, you know, I failed, man. And it was like, I didn't want to feel what I was feeling. And for the next three years, I, I just get loaded all the time. And, and, and it was out there that I met my second wife-to-be. You know, she was like 18, I was 30. It, it was like bliss. <laughs> No drama, but she was a mature 18, just in case there's any parents here, you know. <laughs> Looked like I'm a cradle snatcher. But she did, she chased me around for a couple of years, you know. Now she's 19, now she's 20, we get married. We move into this town, Roselle Park, New Jersey. We move into these apartments, and she's keeping me away from them nightclubs. You know, her attitude, she was like a co-addict from the go. You know, you marry me, have a kid, you won't use no more. Oh man, there was like five cops in my building, all young cops. And they used to like bust people, and then we try the drugs in the basement. We was always partying. Some people was running from the law, I was running with them. <laughs> These guys, they're like crazy, man. They're like, we're in Plainfield, New Jersey. And like, they play Russian, they get crazy when, you know, cops are bad people hanging around. They don't know how to use. <laughs> And so somebody playing Russian roulette closed his brains out. out the back door we went, man, we never went back there. Everybody's asking questions. I never associated them people. Now the second wife's like, you know, see, because I, I did heating work and I put a furnace in the chief of police's house. And every time the cops would pull me over, they'd say, yeah, it's Gil again, man. You know, I have no idea where he is. And he'd say, well, take him home, man. You know, he put a furnace in my house. I don't want things to look bad. So, you know, they back me up all the time. But the second wife, she said, you know what? You're, you use every day. You do something about that using or I'm out of here. And I was like, hmm, I, I didn't want to lose my second wife. And there was a guy in the building named Arizona Bones. I don't know where the hell he got that name from. And he was going to this Ellis Fellowship. And he had all... A Volkswagen man, all them damn stickers they got, all their sayings, whatever, you know, whatever they are. And, you know, I remember there was a sink upside down on the back of his van, and I, I come home loaded. <laughs> the program was calling me way back. And he used to watch me come in. Right across the street from the very church of a meeting that I started to go to N.A. And, you know, I'd come, I'd fall in a puddle, and I'd drag mud up the stairs and get up the next morning and say, who the hell did this? And he'd say, it was you, goddammit. <laughs> and he used to watch me and say, I'm going to take this guy to a meeting. Well, I knew he was something, and he talked about meetings. And I said, you know what, my wife gave me an ultimatum. I'd do something about you. She's out here. What are you going to do? Could you take me to one of them meetings you go to? And he said, yeah, I'll take you to a meeting. Where do you want to go? And I gave him this, like, I want to go four towns away. He said, man, all you guys want to go four towns away. You go to a meeting in the town you used in, no one will know you. They're all four towns away. He lied, man. I walked into this big-ass church, the other fellowship. You know, this is my story. I don't have another one. You know, some people say it's a mixed message. That's, that's how I, I came to N.A., you know. And so, you know, I go down these stairs. There they are, all the guys I used to play ball with, use cocaine with. They're all up against the wall. And they shirts, hats, you know, oh, Gil, we've been waiting for you, thought you were dead. There they all were, man, all the tough guys, you know. I said, what are you guys doing here, you know, hey, man, we're staying clean, you know, so. And I remember some old timer saying, we need a coffee maker, ours relapsed. Smart asked me, I said, you catch that from coffee? And the guy said, no, man, get your ass in the kitchen. So I thought, well, hey, man, somebody asked me, I'll make, co I make coffee for them 280 some odd juicers, man. I'm in the kitchen, no rehab. I got a belly full of alcohol, I got a chunk full of cocaine, and I'm coming apart, man. I'm fucking jonesing, and I don't know what to do. And this young kid come up to me, and he said, man, you're going to lose it. You better have one of these. And him and I are in the kitchen smoking this bone, and I don't know what was going on, but the fans was blowing it out. There was a speaker. Next thing I know, they come barging in the kitchen. Hey, what the hell are you doing, man? Put that out. You can't do that here. I said, we don't drink. <laughs> no good. No good. I put it out. I don't want to lose my position. I put it out. 
<laughs> but you know, I was in that meeting, I saw other addicts. I knew who they were. We go off to the diner, talk about the drugs we use, talk about our connections. They talk about NA. And I was getting educated. Ah, NA sounds good, you know. And but I stayed, I stayed another year till my wife. Now my wife's coming down to that meeting, right? And I'm like, what are you doing here? She said, I got a problem too. She said they, she was in a cold program. They told her, get out. You got a problem. I said, well, that's nice, but this is my meeting. You know. <laughs> I was territorial like my gophers. Get on your own side of the tank. I'll show you where another tank is, you know. But, you know, she stayed. And uh, they told her, you know, get a sponsored clean house. <laughs> I was the first one to go. Another wife. Here she comes. This one. I don't love you no more. I'm like, oh, man, I'm almost three years clean over there. I'm like, what do you mean you don't love me no more? So I became her confidant. You know, I said, you can't make no major decisions for a year. <laughs> you know that it ain't working, man. No. No way. I don't know what to do. She's serious. She kept saying, when you moving out? When you moving out? I'm sleeping on the couch. We got two kids. Now I got almost two ex-wives, four kids, six kids. You know, I'm on the couch, she's going to meetings, I'm going to meetings, I don't know what meeting to go to. You know, she starts going to N.A., you know, so I stayed away from N.A. a little longer because she was in N.A. You know, she's running away from the other fellowship. It's like, I'm peeking in the window, I don't know where the hell to go, I don't know what to do, what to say. I'm hurting, man, I'm hurting. I couldn't imagine life clean without my family, I really couldn't. My feelings, my emotions were killing me three years clean. I was hurting so bad, man. I didn't want to use. I didn't want to live. I wanted some truck to take me out of here. I contemplated jumping off of railroad tracks in Elizabeth. I was making all these plans. I didn't want to live. And she kept saying, when you leaving? When you leaving? Now, I'm following her around. I'm tapping the phone. She's going to recovery dances. She's out with guys that I recovered with. You know. I'm doing this open heart surgery on myself. <laughs> they call it stalking today. <laughs> you go, you go, yeah, I have to go to jail. You do that today. I tell my sponsees when they break, and they'll follow around. They'll get you. They'll put a straining order on your ass, and you're gonna go to jail. No, no, no. I'm telling you, you get the fuck away from me. You know. <laughs> Meetings, masturbation, meditation. Get away from me. You know, join sex without partners. Do something. But you know, so. <laughs> Sex without partners, swap. Yeah, fastest growing organization in recovery. But um, I don't know what to do. I'm hurting, man. I'm hurting like hell. Finally, I said, I'm out of here. I took my recovery books, my binky, my blanket. I left. You, I'm out of here. I wound up right next to the projects, Wheatquake Park, North New Jersey. There I was, right in the ghetto. <laughs> they stole my car three times. I used to chase them boys all around, man. Give me my car back. I, I had to go on a project to get my car one day. Oh, my God. Anyway, you know, so I got this little four-by-four four room. I don't have much. You know, I'm like, I don't know what to do. I got boxes. I got a couch. I'm hurting. I'm going to meet. You know, I, I don't want to be around, man. I just, you know, I... I couldn't handle it, man. I didn't know I had abandonment issues, you know. And uh, I used to go in the cemetery next to the projects and, and scream and yell because I didn't want to bring it to a meeting, you know. And, uh, and, and a bunch of addicts, alcoholics, were banging on my door one day. Yo, Gil, you in there? Yeah, where the hell you think I am? I said, come on, man, we're going to go on a retreat up in the mountains in New Jersey. And the guy's going to talk about the steps. And it was like 80 bucks, but they want to be committed, I gave them 10 bucks. I didn't want to go. PMS, I packed my suitcase. Now I'm on this retreat with 100 men. Addicts and alcoholics at that time. And you know, I don't want to be with no 100, I don't want to be not with 100 men. I want to be with somebody. But it wasn't 100 men is what I had in mind. <laughs> you know. And so here I am, I'm on this retreat. Now the wife's new living boyfriend's there, right? Now you don't think my higher power has a sense of humor? There he is. I got to look at this guy's puss. 
You know, he's hanging his robe where I once hung mine. He's putting his slippers where I once put mine. You know, he's sitting on my front lawn in the grass I planted. You know, and I'm like, I'm a spiritually murder his ass, you know. And he's telling me it's going to get better, Gil. I said, already is better, you know. And I met this guy, Kenny. He was a priest, clean seven years. He was the retreat master. And he told his story on a Friday night. Sick, sick dude, man. I love him. Man. I mean, he would get loaded, and then the people would throw his ass on the church steps, you know. And, and the nuns would come out of the convent and drag his ass to the rectory. They ain't even supposed to be there. You know, they were like codependent nuns. They were probably narrow nuns. You know, it's, it's an underground, you know. And, you know, so... He steal his brother's motorcycle. His brother was a state trooper in Jersey. He used to take their bikes home. And he'd get loaded and, and pull people over with his brother's motorcycle and his brother's and the cops would lock his ass up. Monsignor had to come pull his ass out of jail. They didn't believe he was a priest. This is the guy giving the retreat. I fell in love with him. My kind of priest. You know. He told dirty jokes. You know, he spit, he cursed and gave mass on Sunday. <laughs> All my life I'm looking for one of these guys, you know. He'd be just like me. And I'm walking in the garden on a Saturday morning. And he took one look at my sorry ass. He's three and a half years clean I was. He said, Gil, what's up with you? And I told him what I just told you about the wife leaving. How I don't want to live. I don't want to be here. I don't want this recovery. And it was he who broke them first three steps down for me. And he said, you know what, Gil? The first step is you can the second one is he can. Third one is Gil wants you let up. And I'm like, holy shit. It's like, I heard that, you know, but it didn't sink in. I, I'm going down the freeway after this retreat. I'm singing it like a song. I can, he can, I'm going to let him. You know, I'm pumped up, man, like I am now. I'm pumped up. I get to the home group. I'm like, Horshack, oh, call on me, man. I got, you know, I can, he can, I'm gonna, you know, like. I'm going to tell somebody something the basic text didn't say, you know. And uh, I'm still hurting. I'm still hurting. And the guys are telling me, you go to NA, man. Get the hell out of here. There she was, holding hands. She's holding hands with this guy, and I'm, like, I'm out of here, man. They took me to my first NA meeting in Bergen Pines, New Jersey. And it's still there. And I walk in there. And the heroin addicts are on one side, the pill addicts are on the other. They're arguing who's the real addict. I'm like, holy shit, where the hell did you take me? And the boy said, don't judge that anybody his first meeting. <laughs> I went back again. I didn't judge that meeting. They called me the grape because I came from another fellowship. They called me the grape. And you know what? I kept coming, persevering. I wasn't going to let sick people tell a sick person who, what they should do. I kept coming. <laughs> I like, I saw the hope. I saw the hope in guys like Ronnie H. And all, the other, and all those other guys. I saw, I saw the love they had for the fellowship. I said, I want that. I want that. And I began my journey. Already three and a half years clean. I began this journey in Narcotics Anonymous. And uh, I get this confidant, you know. And I'm like, you know, I said, listen, man. I went on this retreat with these guys. And, and, and it's like... What am I going to let this God do if I let him? He said, Gil, you're at a good place. I said, you know what? See, I knew that I must internalize those first three steps or I would have been clean three and a half years. And I knew if I didn't work the steps of narcotics and honor, something was going to happen to me. You know, I was going to either put a rope around my neck or use and die or jails, institutions, and death. There it is. There's the outline. There's the outcome. And uh, he, so he says to me, I don't know what you did over there in the other fellowship, he said, but over here, he said, what we do is we write on all the steps. <laughs> I thought you do. <laughs> Why would you do that? He said, get some perspective. And he simplified it for me. He said, get a pen, pad, and a dictionary. I said, Why? See, newcomers, you can do this. You, you don't need no sponsor to do this. He said, Gil, look up the word powerlessness. I know what the hell it meant. 
You know, look up unmanageability. You know, look up sanity. Insanity. Big difference. <laughs> you know, will. What will? Whose will? Why a will? You know, what's moral? What's an inventory? You know, and I got these definitions and I got a little perspective on myself. You know, I, I, he helped me out. And he, and he was like me. He said, you grew up with punishing God, didn't you? Oh, man. I said, you know what? Every time me and the boys stole something, we'd fall down, scrape our knee, get hurt, break an arm, they'd steal from us. We'd say, right away, we knew that God was getting even with our ass. I hung around with Catholics all my life. You know, you are what you pay attention to. They were talking about this punishing God, and I thought for a long time he was after my ass, I'll tell you that. I said, I don't know about this God thing, man. You know, it's like, you know, and I remember him taking me to my apartment, and we did the third step prayer. My first one was, take my will and my wife, you know. My, you know he said, no, no, don't go that way. He did one with me because he was, said he was working with me. He needs one. He said, come on, man, it was nighttime. He said, come outside. I said, okay. The stars were out. He said, pick out a star. I said, that one, that real bright star. He said, yeah, come on back in. Remember that star. Okay, go back in and we're talking about some shit. Now or later we come back out. Where's your star? I come back out. I said, oh, shit, somebody moved it. He said, yeah, and it wasn't you, was it? I said, no. <laughs> it was like, and I said, oh, there is something more powerful than I am. He said, you bet your ass. And Narcotics Anonymous is more powerful than you are, too. You know, and there was this old guy, Joe, old Dauphine, sat in the other fellowship, clean a long time, sat in the back room. He was one of them guys. He didn't have to say nothing. You could see the wisdom all over his ass, you know. And I said, what would you do with this God thing, Joe? He said, Gil, I figure I better believe him there's a God there, just in case he is there, not believe in him, then find out he was there. You know, hold that, like, you know, backdoor protection, you know. And I was like, so, yeah, okay, so I kind of like went with that. And I can remember calling on this God. You see, I didn't have him when I started the steps. My decision was, I'm going to do the rest of the steps in Narcotics Anonymous, or I'm not going to live. I'm not going to make it. And I said to that God, I don't know who you are, where you are, what you are. I'm going to go through the rest of the steps of Narcotics Anonymous. Only if I need you will I call on you, wise ass mate. See, I don't know about step 11, you know. It's like, you know, I've set myself up. But that prayer that I said to him, that deal, was I accepted an outcome before it even happened. Or I wouldn't be here today. As I look back at it now. Nothing changes in that third step except that decision to do a fourth step. And I went to him and I said, what do I do? You see, there, you got all the literature today, works how and why. You, you got things that I didn't have when I first came around NA. You know, we, we, used, we, we tapped into each other's source and Ron had mentioned that. We, we did, we compared notes. I would go up to... Uh, up to uh, Bergen Pines, up that way, I would go to, uh, how hell, all them damn steps, Hawthorne, New Jersey, man, and, and we would compare notes. You know, if some addict found another way to stay clean that was working a little better for them, we would pass that on. And when that man told me to write the definitions down, he said, you get a notebook, you skip some pages with your definitions, because as you journey through recovery, you will add on to your step writings. See, there, there is the basic text says, our sponsors take us through the steps. I didn't come here to tell you how to work them, or why you should work them. All I'm telling you is what works for me. And that's what I'm here for. And if anything, I'm going to talk about the steps of Narcotics Anonymous, because I believe that's what the program is, the rest of this fellowship. And I know today that if I don't look at what's left, now that I haven't used in 22 and a half years, that's what's going to take me out of here. And it'll manifest itself in an attitude of behavior, of shit-ass belief, or resentment towards somebody, or she's a jerk, he's a jerk. Whoa. I ain't entering no gates of N.A. in heaven with an attitude like that. God will hit the buzzer. Go back, work them steps. I ain't accepting your ass. But you know, it's like, it's a, it's a whole new, you know, jeez. I go to this guy and I'm like, what do I do? 
He said, you know what, Gil? I want you to go all the way back to your childhood as far back as you can remember. Yeah. I want you to write down everything everybody ever did to you, how you felt about it. And everything you ever did to everybody else, how you felt about that. And I said, okay. <laughs> I don't know, okay, it takes five months. I don't know, I come up with a scholastic autobiography of Gil. Right, wrong, or indifferent, I'm still here. So obviously, I must have been thorough from the very start, or I wouldn't be clean today. And I'm hurting, man. I'm fine. I see all this. I can see everything. I can see it. Rejection. Abandonment. Shame. Blame. Guilt. Huh. Illness on top of illness. Three and a half years clean. I had it. Walking around the rooms with untreated addiction. That's me. The three-stepper. I'm powerless. I'm sorry. I'll help somebody. You know, there's nine more steps. Get my ass in gear. And he told me that my fourth step is my blueprint. Everything I need for the rest of the steps is in my fourth step. All the garbage, all the crap, everything that went down all my life, along with some assets, were the very things I needed. My liabilities become my assets in my recovery. Out of that fourth step, he would find some old attitudes, some old behaviors. You know, and then he said, you know, out of that, we can get, we can get a six-step list of some of your glaring defects. Whoa. We're going to get an eight-step list of some people you harm. A lot of progress there. And I can remember going back on that retreat I went. Six months later, I'm on this retreat. I got all this stored stuff, man, in my gut, my heart, you know. I'm like, damn, man, he wanted me to get all that shit on paper, get it out of my head, get it out of my gut, get it out of my heart, because it, it would leave room for some new information. And I'm on this retreat. There he is, the wife's ex-boyfriend. Now he's the ex-boyfriend, you know. She throws him out. <laughs> I, get, I get evil, I go, it's gonna get better, man, you know. He, he's like, he wanted to fucking kill me, man. I go to this priest. And my sponsor went with me. And I said, look at this shit. What is all this stuff, man? You know, why was I molested by a priest? I'm telling a priest, what's up with that, man? He said, well, he is sick. Like we were when we were out there and I was using stupor, man. You were sick, too. He said, you know what, we're going to pray for his ass. I said, I will, I tell. But I did. I prayed for his ass. You know, I'm not saying that what made me an addict. I'm not saying my home life made me an addict. I was something ready to happen the day I stole the cookies out of the cookie jar. I knew that. <laughs> I knew that. I knew I wasn't normal. <laughs> but you know what? Ron said it the other day. We have issues, man. And some of that shit's still there. Incest in my family. You know, my wife leaving me. I don't know if I was supposed to be gay or what, man, you know? That's why I don't know what the hell was going on. I couldn't sort me out for shit in early recovery. I was really lost. And, uh, I don't know, I'm on this retreat and, I, and I'm dumping to these guys. And, and my, I was like, oh man, if they take this shit back to the rooms, you know, and then I thought, well, they started telling me about them. They were sick dudes, man. I said, oh, I thought I was bad. They were worse than me. Things they did were worse than the things I did. Things that happened to them were worse than the things. And I thought, my trust factor was, they tell on me, I'll tell on them. You know, so, you know. But I'll tell you what, I, I can remember, them, them guys brought me to my true nature before I can get to the exact nature of my wrongs. And you want to know what the bottom line of that whole thing is? I did not trust that God. I did not trust this God I have today all my life. I thought he was singling me out. Even when I was a little boy, a young man, an active addict, an addict in recovery, I thought he was after my ass for a long time. But I was wrong. I didn't know he was caring and loving. And when they brought me to my true nature, I went back to this guy a year later, and like Ron said, them defects do not go away. My addiction's not gone. Why would my defects of character be gone? Something that I ran with all my life. I ran with all my life. And that man told me, 
We need to go into another journey of open-mindedness for what's left now that guilt doesn't use. He says, you got defects. He says, and you know what? Some of them are glaring. And that's the only one. You can't fix something you can't spot. That's why when you get into a relationship, you find them. They all there. <laughs> they were there before I used, when I used, and then they pop up when you clean. And, uh, and, and I, like what they, I like what this man told me. He became my confidant. And he said, Gil, let's go over that four step. Let's pick out some glaring defects. Like where I was a thief. He made me put that on a paper. You were a thief. You were this. You were that. And then he made me draw a line down the middle and, and write some opposites. Being honest. You know. Write down the line. You know. To cut it short. And then I'm like, wow, what's up with that? He said, what I want you to do is try to practice being those opposites. Whoa. And he said, when they don't move, then you take them through the first three steps. I can't, you can't, I'm going to let them. And, and sometimes I had to do that. To this day, I'll take a character defect, false label it, dress it up, make believe I don't have it, rationalize, justify behind the behavior of it. Now it's a shortcoming. There it is. See, so six don't get you, seven will. It's an addict trap. <laughs> the guy that made the steps, it was for alcoholics, but they trap addicts too. You know, you think you're done with them. You know, I remember hanging out in a, in a men's meeting. And they said, oh, God gave me them defects. Let them have them. Yeah, hold on. He ain't going to remove anything from me unless I take up some of his qualities. And they were mentioned here this weekend. Being caring, loving, kind, thoughtful, understanding, patient, and tolerant. You know what they are? Opposite to my defects. Against my nature, I don't know about you. They're totally against my nature. If I live within the realm of them and I practice those opposites, I don't need my old traits. I don't need them. There's a difference. And here's the catch. Here's where people relapse. Behind every opposite of my defect is a little bit of knowledge of God's will for guilt. There are a hundred known character defects to a human being. And I know that for, I only, you know, there are more. I don't want to scare you. <laughs> I don't want to scare me. But I only stole 30. You guys got the other 70. You know. And when your 70 generates my 30, program says, look at me, not you. Because in Jersey, they used to say, what I see in you, I have myself. Because if you spot it, you got it. If you thought it, you've done it. <laughs> early stages, early stages, those defects will manifest themselves, they will turn an addict around 180 degrees, and they'll let that disease in. Kathy from Pittsburgh says it all. You let one in, they're all coming. Oh, you talk about open-mindedness. I have distortions in my thinking, hidden flaws in my character all the time. Ooh. As soon as I think I got my slate clean, something new pops up, disguises itself. You know. I'm the come to NA, tell you the drugs kick my ass, the disease of addiction kick my ass, and that takes away some of the power, doesn't it? When we share with each other, the NA way. Now I come to NA and I talk about what's left, because if I give power to what's left, it will take me out of here in some form or another. And that's why people relapse, because they don't fail to complete their step work. I know that for a fact. I know that from working with other addicts. Powerful, man, powerful. It's a lifetime job. An old timer told me the sixth step is, I don't do what I want to do. The seventh step is, I do what I don't want to do. See, there's a lot of goddamn wisdom there, you know. And it's like, you know what, you better get the tape from Mitch, because that might save your ass someday. <laughs> Always push the tape out of it. But it's true. They are the two most miswork steps in recovery. You know, you go around, people who work the steps know who ain't working them. We know. You know, it's like, you ain't did a four step, have you? No. And no shit, it shows. You know, it's like... <laughs> But you know, we can challenge one another caring and lovingly. We can, you know. 
you know, I got a partner in my life, you know, when, when, and I'm concerned about her spiritual condition all the time, you know. But, you know, that's just the way it is. And, uh, and so I got a six-step list. What is a defect of character? You want to know what it is? Minute. Here it is. Anything that would stand in my way being used to the human being, to an addict, to myself, to my higher power. Think about that. That, I said, holy shit. That's like fine-tuning. He said, do you, do you want to stay clean? He told me my son. Yeah. I said, well, then you need to fine-tune. You need to fine-tune. If you ever go home someday and you pull a dictionary out, you know what you do? Read the definition of conduct. Yeah, I forget what it is, but read it. It's very interesting. I'll pull it out every once in a while myself. You know, and I need to do that because sometimes my conduct is not what it's supposed to be. You know. And so now I got an eight step list. Who the hell would I harm? Holy shit. We go back into that four step. Who'd you harm? Take a look at this. Ex-wives, parents, kids, institutions, people all money to, ladies, old ladies I ripped off. The old guy in the gas station I ripped off. Man, a list hits the ground. Why you need a sponsor? There you go. You got another page. Eight step. Make a goddamn column. Put them people you harmed and then in nine, check them off as they come along. But some of that stuff had to be in God's time. I don't know where they were. I'd have to pray to God. You know, these people ain't going to come across my life. <laughs> and my sponsor said, you know what? You better pray that they do. And you want to know something? When so many people came into my life, I was like, holy shit, you get what you pray for. These people that I thought I'd never see again popped into my life and I got my opportunity to make my amends. I made some indirect amends. You know, a lot of people were dead. You know, and, and oh man, my parents are in a hospital, Elizabeth, New Jersey. My mother's in Edison, my father's in Elizabeth. I'm eight years clean, I'm running around, I'm like, he thinks she's dead, he thinks, you know, you know, know what they say to me? Are you still going to them meetings? I was like, I don't know. What, my mother and father had this guilt because they abused substances. They thought I caught it from them. <laughs> I said, no, I didn't, I didn't catch it from them. At least I don't think I did. I assured them that the best thing that ever happened to me was N.A. And when I put my arms around my parents and told them I loved them before they died, my mother told them, my son's a good boy, go to N.A. I go, oh, Ma, right in Edison where there's a meeting there. You know, and the nurses go, oh, yeah, we know that place. I said, Mom, man, baseball. It's a lifetime job. You know what? If someone raised you, housed you, fed you, clothed you, an aunt, uncle, whatever, grandparents, you're getting clean, call them, man. Call them up. Open those doors. It's all about rebuilding torn and tattered relationships with others. And God clears that path for me to come to Him. That's really what it's about. I can't live clean in the now until I straighten out my past. At least until I attempt to straighten it out. I cannot live comfortable now. And you want to know something? Ten step. <laughs> New York is at the Mayor Cost step. You know what I got? How am I doing? You know, it's like we used to call it the how am I doing step. I leave anything out from one to nine. Show up in my relationship with you people, people in my home group, in my work life, in my personal life. It'll show up. I leave anything out. I need to know if I got things right with man or God. I need to know am I doing the right things for the right reasons as a recovering addict. I need to know that. I need to know that if I hurt you today, I hurt me. I can't afford to hurt you. I can't afford to hurt me. And I got a 10-step prayer that I made up. Not conference approved yet, but it will be. <laughs> I go to bed at night and I say, you know what, God, tomorrow I hope people are as nice to me as I was to them today. Mm, that's just me. I, <laughs> was I nice to people? Sometimes I miss the mark. I don't want to use the last part of that 10-step. And if I keep using the last part of that 10-step, something's wrong. Something's wrong. I missed something somewhere along the line. I need the 10-step because it clears me for the ultimate of all steps. 
11. That's my ultimate step, man. You know, I need to know if I got things right. And you know what? I don't live a life by how I feel or what's going on sometimes. I learned that a long time ago to nurture my feelings. You know, the, the steps have helped me with that. They say it's not a self-help program. Fuck them assholes. Don't you believe it? I did the footwork and the results was up to God. And again, I accepted that outcome before it even happened. And they want to know, do I want to prove my conscious contact with that God? I said, I don't know who you are, what you are, where you are. Do I want to prove that? They said, through prayer and meditation, I can do it. And I ain't no big meditator. But I'll tell you what I do. I still my mind. I go in a dark room. I light a candle. I'm a simple candle meditator. You light a candle. You rest your mind. You ain't worried about sponsees, ex-wives, IRS, what's going on in the room. I want to touch this higher power. I want to, like, get close. And I look at the flames, and I see the yellows, the reds, the blues, the greens. And I'm like, wow. I blow it out. I see this face looking back at me. I put a face on my higher power today. Tears coming down his eyes. He's smiling. He approves of this addict. He approves of me. I say, you know what, God, all my life I'm asking you, get me out of this, do this. You know, when I was using, when I got clean, you know, and I, and I, and I stopped and I said, you know what, I never asked what I could do for you today. You did all this for me. And right then and there, my will's not in the way. That instant, that second, what can I do for you today, God? You did all this for me. I thank Him for keeping me clean. I thank Him for the things He's taken away through the steps. I thank Him for what He's given me through the steps. And then I thank Him for what's left. That's what humbles me. Nobody hit my ass with no well on, I'll tell you right now. I'm going to magnify His name. Right now, today, and now. He loves me. He forgave me my derelictions. Awesome. Don't miss that. Don't miss that connection. That's my last connection. <laughs> and having had, check that out. Having had spiritual awakening. Result, having had. Doesn't last long. It's like an orgasm. You know. I don't know how to describe it's like an orgasm. You want another having had? Work for it. Just like you do an orgasm. I know you understand that. I want to have you had all the time. Said I'm gonna try and carry a message. Don't say I will. And Ron touched on it. Don't say I'm a messenger. I don't know what's coming out of me. I know what I feel. You know. Carry a message, not a mess. Something happened to me through those steps in Narcotics Anonymous. Check this out. Forgiveness took place. Yeah. <laughs> Forgiveness. You know what? It, I looked it up. I got this definition. It's an act that takes an enormous amount of spiritual strength. Where the hell would me get an enormous amount of spiritual strength? Falling down ass addict. Through all the weaknesses I exposed in the 12 steps of Narcotics Anonymous along with some assets, have given me some spiritual strength to go on from here. To find out what the knowledge of His will is for me. Yeah, find the opposite to your defect skill, and you will exceed. Carry the message. Work with another addict. Help somebody, Gil. Help somebody. Give back what NA was given to you. You know. And it's like, forgiveness, man. It's good for the forgiven. It's good for the forgivers. Because forgiveness fosters humility. There's no addict here going to stay clean without some degree of humility. No line is, I'm just as powerless over my addiction as the gay I came in. More likely to use, you know, I'm relatively happy, joyous, and free. <laughs> they got a place where people are happy all the time. I'll stay away from there. <laughs> and humility brings on gratitude. There's no one here going to stay clean, doesn't have gratitude for God opening that door that I couldn't open 
to come in here. The door that Ron talks about. God opened my door. I was afraid. He pulled my ass in. Get in here, goddammit. You little white boy, you don't know nothing. And awesome. You know. Gratitude brings on emotional balance. Emotional recovery is something to shoot for. I work with a lot of addicts, man. I watch them. I've seen people take their lives clean. You know, the workshop they had, you know. They don't, drugs won't kill you. What's left will kill you. Your secrets will kill you. I throw my four-step on the middle of the floor and read the goddamn thing. I ain't got nothing. I ain't proud of some of that shit. But you want to know something? If it set you free, like it set me free, read it. I don't need to run off to some special interest meeting because I'm afraid to say something. We used to go to the AIDS meetings because guys wanted me to sponsor them. I, had, hey, I know I would go to that damn AIDS meeting in North, find out what's going on. I need to educate myself. We can't isolate ourselves here. I wanted to commit suicide. Three and a half years clean. I said to that guy, I want to kill myself. He said, man, why would you kill somebody you don't know? <laughs> I said, yeah. Yeah, right? I'll tell you what, if you're a newcomer, welcome to Narcotics Anonymous. Awesome program. And if you got a plan on how you're going to stay clean, you better tell one of us. Do what your fucking plan is, man. You know, tell us. Because <laughs> we got it. it, works. How it works. We got one. It, it's here. It worked. It worked for me. It worked for my predecessors. And you want to know something? Real quick. That's only half the program. There are another set of principles that I use in my recovery, which is the other half of the program. And they're called the traditions. They teach me how to get along with other human beings that I've learned what works in my home group, works in my personal life. I've proven that to myself. And it ties that bind us together. If we keep them stronger than the ones that tear us apart, all will be well. And we're all gonna recover from the same disease in tradition, we really are. We're all gonna recover from the same disease, no matter what we use, how much we use, where we came from, what it did to us, you know, my four step. No. <laughs> and, uh, and then, and then, two talks about the heartbeat of NA, the group, the group, the Narcotics Anonymous group. Here it is. That's it. That's the heartbeat of NA. That we're to make ready a room. You're an addict in recovery. What do you do? Make ready a room for some more addicts yet to get here. Make it ready. You know. Three tells you what the requirement is: the desire not to use that shit. And four talks about autonomy. Five hundred dollar word, newcomers can't say it. <laughs> you know, it's a uniqueness with intent and purpose. When I was in California, they had a beach meeting. That's different. You know, they put a white flag in the sand. People will go down the strand. They get around a circle, say the serenity prayer, and then people go, oh, there they go again. Every week they get around a circle and they say, you know, who the hell are they? It's different. That's autonomy. <laughs> they don't have to pay no rent. <laughs> you know, they got all kinds of money coming in. We had the spin the wheel thing out in California. It had steps and traditions on it. And you walk in the room, they give you one of these tickets. And if the, if the secretary called your number, you had to go spin the wheel wherever it landed on the chair. You know, it land on step four, they spin the wheel again. You know? <laughs> They land on a tradition, they spin the wheel again. Uh, they'll do the NA fifth. I'll share where I'm at now. It works. It's different. <laughs> and five, we're to maintain an atmosphere of recovery in our rooms. I can stay clean. You can get clean. And some more newcomers can get clean. We need to do that. The groups are like the spokes in a wheel. If your spokes are loose, the wheel is going to wobble. I've been around the country. The fucking wheel is wobbling. They come here. I see them all the time. What's NA going to do for me? Whoa, 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 whoa. You got it all wrong. 
you ought to come up with what can I do for NA. See, those are the people that stay clean. Takers don't make it. Only givers make it. Give whatever way. There's a slot for everybody here. Twelve step tells us that. Some people are good at sponsorship. Some aren't. Some are good at secretaries. Some are good at this. There's a physician for everybody. You don't know what to do? Bring some goddamn cake plates and forks to your meeting. Because you all never got them. Bring some cups. You know? Like, get there early. Leave late. You know? That's what you do. That's what I did. That's ABC. Ashtrays, brooms, and chairs. That's what it is. And you know, six tells us not to divert from the purpose. You know, I don't, I don't bring another message here from where I came from. It's, it's, in, it's in here, but I don't, I don't need it. You know, Vito says it all. We don't bring our message to another fellowship. We don't expect theirs here. Because it will divert us. Not that there's anything wrong with it. And you know, six to twelve tells you, hey, can screw up five. Simple as that. It tells you, don't divert from it, support it. Number seven, you know, put some money in the goddamn basket. You know, instead of buying all this stuff. And it talks about being non-professionals. Titles and degrees mean nothing. I'm not talking about what Ron did, or a lot of other addicts that went and got their degrees. That is awesome for an addict to get a degree. What I'm talking about is the highest position you get here is clean. You don't go no farther than that. You know, and they're all running around here saying, I'm one of these, I'm one of them. Shit, you're just clean. That's all you are. You're just an addict. And tell them not to be organized. <laughs> I went out to California. <laughs> First thing I said, doing the meetings all wrong. Oh, man. Mexicans wanted to string my ass up. Who is this guy? They call New Jersey. Who's this guy? He's got 11 years clean. You know him? <laughs> they call New Jersey. Make sure I had 11 years clean. They didn't trust me. They're doing a business meeting during the meeting. I said, don't do that. You're taking the time away from the newcomer. Invite them to your business meeting. You know, things like that. You know, there's a lot to that. But that, was, that, that still goes on. Where they'll take the time away from a meeting to talk about group business. Hey, have your damn group business before or after the meeting. I used to, and, and a lot of guys said, we like that, Gil. Then, of course, when I moved, when I moved to Denver, <laughs> I said, you're doing it all wrong. <laughs> And there was this guy here 20 years clean telling us this shit. He said, you better listen to him. Outside issues. I'm a diabetic, you know. But, you know, I don't, I don't mean to bring that here. I use the stuff for my diabetes. It sucks. It sucks. It wants me dead, too. You know. And so it's my issue. So, you know, <laughs> I'll say what I want to say. You know, that, and then 11, they talk about attraction. Yeah, check it out, man. <laughs> will somebody come back to this convention next year? You bet your ass they will. I'm going to tell everybody about this place. Awesome. And then, of course, anonymity. You know, spiritual foundation. Anonymity. I can say I go to meetings, not you. You know, it happens all the time. I'm in a diner and they're like, hey, did Joe go to the meeting? I don't know. Well, you were there. I said, you want to know? Go. You know, I ain't telling you who was at a meeting and who wasn't. I'm not. And I saw it this weekend. And I'm just bringing a point. I ain't bringing people down. There's 800 people in a room. And that gives up a lot of personal desires to come share his or her own spiritual strength and hope. And only 25 addicts hug the speakers. Don't do that, man. Hug your speakers. You know, not that I look for the hugs. You know, but you know. I'm going to tell you what. In old New Jersey recovery, there was this guy, Harry. Old Harry speaks all over, says, says the same old shit. My sponsor said, yeah, my first sponsor, he said, you know what? I want you to go up there and hug him when he's done sharing. I said, what? He said, because you'll put the principles before your own personality. Until you can do it with yourself, you won't do it with others. You may not like what that speaker had to say. You know, you might say, yeah, well, he, ain't, he or she ain't walking in that. T you know what? Go hug the speaker, whether you like the person individually or not. Because when you walk out, you'll have put the principles before your own personality. And then, I don't know what's going on in that, eh, but I don't see enough of it. Take that with you wherever you go. I'm a predecessor. I know what works. And that don't work. That is not an A.
My sponsor tells when I go to a convention, he said, you hang out at the workshops, you hang out with the speakers, you hug them, you listen. I don't disappear, you know, unless I want to go see some sights, that's a different thing. But I'm saying, you know, in my heart, I'm not doing that. I'll, I'll come back and I'll tell that speaker, I'm sorry I didn't make it, but you know what I'm saying? If anybody, I'm sensitive, man. You do that to me, I want to know fucking why, you know. <laughs> Not that I was. And you know what? I live on this three-legged stool. The concept of Narcotics Anonymous. I ain't going to talk about it, I promise. Three-legged stool. Steps, traditions, concepts. And the concepts complement the traditions. You can put them in your lives. Read them. They got a pamphlet. They're awesome. It talks about integrity. Dignity. The dignity tells us we're worth far more than we think we are. And it glorifies the home group. That the home group is the heartbeat of Narcotics Anonymous. It was there before World Service. It was there before areas. It was there before regions. The home group is the heartbeat of NA. When we improve on our home groups and we participate in our home groups, we invite more addicts to this fellowship. We can help more people. What we do with our lives today will depend upon the lives yet to get here. Check that out. Check that out. What we do with our lives. Hey, newcomer ain't the most of them. They're a pain in the ass newcomer. You know, always looking for a sponsor. They don't call it, you know. <laughs> I scared the shit out of them in my hometown. But they know I love them. Man. And I'll help any addict. Any addict. I don't shoot our wounded in narcotics and I don't shoot them. Every human being is important. Every addict God puts through the doors of our home groups. Get them. Treat them tenderly. Hold on to them. Don't let them go. Don't let them go. My life is awesome today. Ron's right. You know, he takes care of us. <laughs> I've been through some tough times clean, man. Ten years clean, I lost everything. And all I had was my NA home group, a bunch of guys, basic text and a higher power, and I knew that's all I needed at 10 years clean to build my life over again. My wife and I, 60 years old, we bought a house, got a 30-year mortgage. So you know I ain't dying. I, I cut my grass, man, with a lawnmower I bought. I didn't steal this one. My neighbor goes, hey, how you doing? I said, that's right, man, it's my lawnmower. He looks at me like, yeah, I guess it is. You know. <laughs> God's been good to me. My wife and I don't put a lot of emphasis on our marriage. Awesome marriage. She's clean 14 years. She was going to other fellowships. When we moved to Denver, she joined my NA group. She loves it. I'm so proud of her. She's working with other women. I mean, beat up women, man. And she's putting her heart out to these women. And I'm so proud of her, man. You know, she likes that. <laughs> That's pretty cool. I converted her ass. <laughs> That's awesome, man. You know what? I want to th West New York, man, region. Thanks, man, for calling my white ass out here. And you know what? I love you all, man. I'm an addict. My name's Gil. Thanks. Man.